Okay, welcome. My name is Gary Hudson, and today I'm going to be taking you through um, building a tidy models classification model from scratch. I work as a head of machine learning, and I'm also a senior NHSR fellow. So before I continue with the uh, the webinar this morning, uh, this afternoon, I'm going to let you know about existing opportunities to get involved in the NHSR community. So we run training courses. So the introduction to R is a monthly course that we run. Workshops on forecasting, shiny machine learning, GT plots, Sankey diagrams, and much, much more. Webinars, we've obviously got the annual conference that's just concluded. Solutions, so these are aimed at solving real life NHS problems or making the life easier for NHS analysts. And we've got funder projects there as well. So to hit us up, we've, we're at www.nhsrcommunity.com. We've got a YouTube uh, channel, NHSR community handle. We've got a Slack feed, so if you're not a member of Slack already, please request to join. Uh, and we're also available on Twitter. We also run a book club and do an annual survey. We've got 2.2K members and we're growing uh, 16 fellows, two associates and eight champions. Today, our feature partner is HexiTime, which is a free platform to exchange ideas and ideas for healthcare and improvement, offering things like coaching, software skills, presentation skills, peer review, patient safety advice, etc. OK, so this this webinar today should run up until 2 p.m. It's all been recorded and it'll be later available on uh, all the platforms that we've indicated there, normally uploaded on YouTube as well. If you've got any questions, uh, please address them in the Q&A. If we don't get time for questions, please address us personally on Slack. There is a machine learning uh, handle there, but you can put that in the general Slack feed. Um, NHSR runs communities and webinars every month. I'll just iterate to the next slide. So the next webinar is our upcoming events. Um, or there's one coming up in uh, February. But yeah, let me launch into the uh, into the presentation. So today we're going to build a tidy tidy models classification mod from scratch um so yeah let's get started so what what is tidy models so a lot of you'll be familiar with the tidyverse and it's a similar kind of ecosystem to the tidyverse so it, in, it includes a modeling package uh, called parsnip pre-processing packages called r sample and recipes it also includes training and validation so like i said parsnip validation yardstick and some hyperparameter tuning options as well. So let's get started. We're going to run this through in the R Studio, but I've also bought up the the R Markdown notebooks just for ease. So switch into the R Studio. First of all, we're going to import our libraries. So what we're going to need is tidy models, read R, broom for tidying up uh, linear regression outputs. Remotes, Deployer, Magritte. We're going to use some parallel processing, so you need parallel and do parallel. We're going to look at global vari variable importance, so we need the VIP package. We're going to do some uh, upsampling of our minority classes, so we're going to use Themis. We're going to use the broom. We're going to use a confusion tabler package, which essentially allows you to clap collapse down confusion matrices into an easy format to uh, work with. And we'll see that shortly in the presentation. So starting out with tidy models. So the first thing to do, and the first thing we're going to do here is bring in our data set. So this is in the NHSR data sets package, which was another solution that's been funded, and it's the stranded data package. So what, first of all, we're going to set the names of all the columns and I'm going to add a, uh, I'm going to mutate the stranded classification label because we're all going to want to predict on this later on. And then just going to simply pre-processing, I'm going to drop the NAs. You can do some NA imputation methods there, but for the sake of clarity, I'm just dropping them for now. So reviewing what the data looks like, this is a very simple and um, synthetically generated data set based off a common inpatient problem of trying to address whether a patient's going to be a long wait or not on the first day of their inpatient stay. This has some simple fields uh, like the stranded label, what the age of the patient is upon admission, 
care home where they've been referred from there if they're medically safe hcop if they need any hcop access if they've got any previous care in the last 12 months their admission date and their frailty description so things like if they've got um frailty problems etc okay so we've got the head of the data frame we've got the data loaded into into our environment so the next step really in terms of strategies to build machine learning models is to look, especially when we talk about supervised classification machine learning, is to address the class imbalance. So to just assess what the imbalance looks like. So if I look at the table, you can see that predominant, predominantly, and this is what you'd expect, and this would be true to your real life data, you've probably got about 70% of patients that are uh, not stranded or not uh, long waiters in your data set and it probably is a much greater than this again this is a synthetic generated example so then we've got like 0.3 so 34 percent of our patients 35 percent are str have stranded labels so as we saw before a stranded label is the stranded class whether they're stranded or not stranded this is this falls into a a set of algorithms called binary classification so you can see that in in proportions using the prop table function and you can see that in just in pure volume terms as well just by indexing how many of them are not stranded versus stranded the next step is i always find it useful to observe the date structures so here i'm going to format the admission date um, using as date the as date function in base base r I'm going to then say, get me the column names, and I'm going to use deplier to select if the stranded patient is a factor. So if the data set contains factors, if it contains numeric values, or if it contains characters. So I've got an, I've got a printout here, and it shows you, you know, the types of uh, characters and factors, etc. So it's printed out my factors, my numbers, my characters. This is best observed actually if we go back to the presentation here so you can see that actually it's printed out the factor is the stranded class the numbers or age uh, the number fields of the age whether it's care or referral they're just kind of flags and a frailty description okay i'm gonna go back into r so the next step with machine learning is common and this is called a um, training and testing split or training and validation split is to split your data so you've got a proportion of the data to train the model on and a proportion. So here I'm using the proportion 75% for training, 25% reserved just to evaluate how well, how well the model fits. So here we're going to use one of the tidy models packages called uh, R-Sample. So we're going to do an initial split on our stranded patient data. And we're going to set the R-Sample to the training. So the training data set, what we want to reserve for training and on sample testing, what we're going to reserve for the testing. And that figures out that I need 75% for my training and 25% for my testing. OK. So we've got that. We've got that strand of data all there and it's ready to go. It's been split into a train and test set. So as you can see, we've got out of the 699 observations records, we've got 524 for the training set. 175 to test the algorithm on. Typically, if you look at the literature, um, good good splitting ratios are about 70% up to 80%. Anything more than that, you start to um, start to get lower gains on, on on the training because you've not got enough to evaluate. So it's hard to evaluate the data in real life. Again, this this is more of an art than a science in terms of the proportions that you choose. But there is there is those rate those limits that 70 percent to eighty percent are good values to choose. So the next step is to use to create our first recipe. So there's a package called recipes. So if I open this in a new tab, which contains a whole lot of steps for preparing your machine learning models, and I like this because it allows you to do it in very much a procedural way. So things like imputing, um, like we said, uh, imputing the missing data, doing some kind of transformation on the data, making it discrete, 
doing Dublin variable and encoding, looking at interactions for probably linear models, normalization, etc. There's a whole heap, I'll have a link to that in the supporting markdown here. So jumping back into it, so what I'm going to do with this data now is I'm going to create my first recipe. So that comes from the tidy models package. So the proper namespace is tidy models recipe. So we're going to use our stranded class label. And we're going to train it on everything else in the data set because they'll be your um, in the, your predictor variables versus your outcome variable or your dependent versus your independent variables. So this essentially says just take everything else bar the stranded class in that data. We can use the training data set that we previously created. OK, so I'm using Magritte to pipe through here. And the next step is to generate some features out of the admin date. So the features, I want the day of the week to be generated and the month to be generated, and that'll be a, a numeric representation of the day of the week and month. Then I'm going to, in the next step, because I've generated features off those, um, I don't want to get some multicollinearity, collinearity issues in my model, so I'm going to remove the admin date. Next step is we had a up sampling ratio, so we talked about class imbalance in the previous step. What we're going to do is up sample that class imbalance, and we're going to over over sample the minority, the minority class, so that being the stranded patients. So this essentially then looks looks at similar, and it's a geometric function, looks at similar patients with similar patterns that occur in a in a ge geometry space, and it'll essentially cluster them together. And it will say, based on this patient that in this space, generate a similar example of that patient, and it essentially just synthetically generates data to then train on, because then that will give you more representation in the patterns that underlie the model. And this is helpful sometimes if you've got a little class imbalance in your data set. If it's a massive class imbalance, then you probably need to go back to data sampling and thinking about how you can how you can split the data out, or essentially just better sampling or querying methods. So here we've got a, a moderate imbalance. We're going to use oversampling here. Okay, and it's it's an algorithm if you want to look it up called SMOTE, synthetic minority oversampling technique. Then we're going to use a dummy. So we've got some nominal uh, variables. By nominal, we've got some character variables in the training data. So the frailty description will be a character variable. It won't know how to deal with that because it needs it in a numerical representation. So it essentially just create a dummy encoding similar to these here. So it's going to dummy all our nominals and it's just going to remove the one that's the outcome variable because it needs that as a factor. OK. And then we're going to get rid of any variables that have zero variance. So essentially this just says if they've got no impact on the thing you're trying to predict, then get rid of those that have zero variance. Next step, we're going to normalize. So we're going to center and scale the data. If there's massive outliers, this really helps in machine learning if you scale the data before you train the model. Um, this data will no longer make sense, but we're using a mean scaling technique here similar to probably z-score scaling that you've probably used in statistics. So if I run that recipe step, it shows me the steps that it's gone through. So I pretty like that's what I like about tidy models. It gives you kind of an audit log of what it's doing to the data. So it's created date features from the admit date. It's deleted terms with the admit date. It's done up sampling based on our stranded class, based on that a fraction that we utilized at the start, the oversampling ratio here. I've got an oversampling ratio, up sample ratio, sorry. You can play around with this to, to see if it has much more of an effect on your model. I, I was testing earlier and some improvements we can, can be gained just by doing that. Um, and then dummy variables were converted. So our dummy variables have been converted. We've, we've Filtered on zero variance, so if they've got no impact on the thing you're trying to predict, get rid of them. And center and scaling have been done on all the predictor variables. OK, so the next step, what we're going to do next is we're going to fit a very simple baseline model. 
So there's a concept in tidy models of creating a model, then creating a workflow for that model, then fitting the model to our data. So we're going to do that next. So first of all, we're going to fit our model. So it says that we've fitted our parsnip logistic regression model. And similar to the recipes um, guidance in tidy models, there's a whole set of these models, albeit not as many as the, the kind of cousin package called Carrot. Uh, they're, they're still building it out. It's still being developed as we speak. But yeah, it, it's definitely growing. So we'll create a, a basic logistic regression model because this can be used for classification using the sigmoidal curve to uh, look where where the uh, observations fall on the 0 and 1 y index. I did a bit more uh, explanation of this in the advanced modeling webinar, so please check that out. So following that, we've, we've fitted this logistic regression model. And the good thing about tidy models is it uses external engines to fit the models. So we use the GLM package to fit that model, which is a separate package to tidy models. So all it's doing is really interfacing with those separate packages, the engine part. So we printed the model, we've got this GLM that's been created, generalized linear model. So now it's time to create our workflow. So this is a really important step in tidy models. So we're gonna create this stranded workflow and we're gonna add our model. So we've got this model, in, instantiated this empty workflow. We're gonna pipe through, we're gonna add a model, this linear regression model. And then we're gonna add a recipe, this stranded recipe that we created. So that'll in, in include all those pre-processing steps that we created in recipes. So you can see that that pre-processing is done. We've got this logistic re regression model linked to this workflow. And we've got six steps that our recipe is applying. So we're gonna step the date, remove, upsample, dummy, get rid of zero variance and normalize. So, okay, what we wanna do now is fit the workflow to our data. So the next step is going to be fitting that workflow. So we're going to use our stranded workflow that we just created in the previous step. And then we're going to fit the data to our train data in the training test split that we did previously. This should fire off. That was a pretty quick uh, model fitting routine because we're not doing any what's called hyperparameter tuning at this stage. So now we're going to extract the fitted data. So the term to use here and this is a recent uh, tidy models improvement it used to be pull underscore workflow underscore fit now it's extract underscore fit underscore parsnip so the other the other term has been deprecated and then we use broom to tidy that up and this works only with linear regression models so it then shows you the essentially associative p-value the, the t stat the standard error uh, and the estimate coefficient estimate and we can use that then in, in potentially a linear model. So if you know how to construct a logistic regression equation, this could just be then built into a, a database. Or you could you could chain it as part of your pipeline. But it's a very simple baseline model, and I'm not sure how well it will perform. I've also included a, um, a way to just look at the significance. So this is using the, the p-value. You could use the t-stat and do a uh, t-stat t-test to see where it where it falls. But uh, I'm using the p-value for now. And we're gonna use a plot to, to pull out the significance. And we're gonna use plot the year. So I've not got many variables in this, this uh, synthetic data set that are actually significant. So really at this step, you'd probably go back to the drawing board and, and, and think about how you gather your data, how you gather the variables in the model. And again, at the, I'll, I'll just put a massive disclaimer here. This is synthetically generated data. So take it with a pinch of salt. So what we're gonna do now, we've got this, we've created this recipe, we've created this workflow, we've fitted our uh, logistic regression model, our GLM. What we're gonna to wanna to do now is make predictions. Okay, so we're gonna make the class prediction. So predicting what class we think it belongs to. So you need to use the, the base predict method, which works with all carrots, uh, MLR3, uh, tidy models, machine learning packages, 
and all, all statistical packages as well, is essentially what we call an S3 generic. OK, so we're going to then use the stranded fit that we've already built here, which is a list of fit items. Uh, we're going to then just say pass in when we did this, the train test split, the test data so we can validate how accurate our model is at classifying. And the same thing for prob the probabilities. So we're going to want to expose the probabilities of it being stranded or a long weight patient versus versus not stranded or not a long later. However you want to term that in the uh, semantics. So we've got this stranded fit and we've got this test data and all you need to include extra is the type equals to probability and that'll expose the probabilities for you. Last thing I'm going to do is uh, bind the predictions together in a data frame. So I'm going to use a class pred, um, pred and the probability, probability <laughs> prediction and I'm going to set the names of whatever I want them to be called. So a logistic regression class, logistic regression not stranded prob and you can call them whatever you want using the set names base function. And then we're going to use the strand pre, um, the, we're going to bind the test data onto the, the uh, predictions that we just made. So if I print all that out, we should have the tail of our LL predictions. And if you look to the strand of preds, you'd have that bound onto the original test data as well. The strand of preds. If I look to that, that'll be the original test data. And at the end, you'd have these predictions here. OK. So that's a way to say how accurate our model is. So we know the label. We know what class it belongs to. And then we can see what class it's predicted. And that's essentially what we're going to do next. So the next step is what I call step eight. And all these steps are included. All these steps are included in the supporting um, markdown notebook. We're going to use a rock plot. So we're going to generate a rock curve. And we'll use the auto plot function. And I've got a lot of variability in this data, but it seems to bottom out around about 72%. If you're not very good at reading rock curves, uh, which I struggle with sometimes, what you can do is use the carrot package. So the carrot package is still my default go to for the confusion matrix function, which is one of the most useful functions in carrot, as well as all the, the cool modeling stuff. So we're going to use that stranded prediction data frame that we created earlier. Yeah, this stranded predict there, stranded preds with the test data. I'm going to use that and I'm going to say, OK, what's my what we call ground truth label? So the stranded class, so what we know it actually is and the testing data set and what the model's predicted. So we're going to see what the disparity is between what we know and what has been predicted. OK, so we're getting we're getting pretty good accuracy here. The sensitivity and the specificity based on the logistic regression model are really very good. Uh, we've got a few misclassifications, but nothing too much to sweat about. So actually that model in itself is a good baseline. A way to visualize this, so I'm going to bring in the confusion table R package, which is available on CRAN, is to generate just a, this only works with binary uh, classifications. So a lot of the tasks you'll do in the NHS will be binary classifications. I built over 90 plus machine learning models for healthcare for different trusts because um, these work cross trust in one of my my roles. So I know that um, a lot of the times you want to do something that's a bit more complicated. It's normally a binary classification uh, task that you set. And this will allow you to visualize those binary class. Sorry, this has been scrunched up a bit in the, the markdown. I think there's some compression happening. But when you get the uh, JPEG, it produces this and it gives you the sensitivity of model. So how well it is at predicting whether the patient's been stranded. And the other end, the specificity, how well it's predicted that the patient not being stranded. These might also be called precision and recall um, estimates as well. You might be used to if you used things like scikit-learn, etc. So if I wanted then to save this information, then I'll flick back again. So that's the confusion table R package. If you want to use um, it then, so this comes in a list format, I'll show you the, the problem. So the confusion matrix we just built comes in a list. 
So what we're going to want to do is collapse that down to record level. So if I look at that, this is an individual list item. These are individual list items and this bit's individual list item as well. So what the, this package does is essentially like broom, it just tidies it up. So I'm going to use the binary class confusion matrix. I'm going to set my train labels to the, the class that we know it was in the in the um, so the truth label, sorry, the class that we know it is in the, the test data. So stranded preds is the stranded class and what the predicted class is there as well. So we're going to essentially say similar to this one up here, what we know versus what we've predicted. And as you can see, this then exports it out into a tibble. So it will give the prediction, so whether it's not stranded and the reference being not stranded. Then the predicted stranded, these are your, um, your false positives and then reference not stranded and it will show you all those statistics and that'll show you the accuracy, kappa, so how well the model will potentially perform with future data, not looking too good. Um, I think Ed, the, the, the normal rule of thumb is with a kappa, it's normally the higher value, the better. Um, and accuracy lower, so your, your error, error limits, your 95% confidence interval around that accuracy statistic. And then sensitivity, so how well it is at predicting whether a patient can be stranded. And specificity, specificity apologies, I always get my tongue wrapped around that one. How well, it, how balanced it is at predicting those that, that are not stranded. And then you've got this balanced accuracy, so it shows you overall over the sensitivity and specificity how balanced your model accuracy is. And with a 0.78, it's not doing too bad, really. Okay, so this was originally composed in two, to two tutorials, but it's a good way of then serializing the model out. So what we're going to do next is we're going to serialize our model data into a stranded data RDA. So a way to store the, all the data that's in this environment currently. So that's been saved. We've got this updated on the 15th of December at 1.27. And I'm going to load it back in. OK. So you'd probably do this and I, I'll talk to you about why you do that in a second. In machine learning land, you would have a training script and everything above here would be a training script. And then you'd have a production script. So you'd want to pick up what's been saved, normally just the save model. You'd pre-process the data in the same way, and then you'd make predictions on production level data. Uh, I did a session on this at one of our informals, but I'll link you to some interesting YouTube uh, watching that I've done previously. So that's our baseline model. So one of the improvement methods would be to fit a model that's probably better at picking up the patterns, so a more complicated model. Do something called hyperparameter tuning, do resampling of the data. So the way that you sample the training and validation data matters. Um, another approach is actually go back and work with domain experts to understand what the business problem is and what variables will be useful at that point that you're trying to predict. And this normally improves your model performance more so than lots of fancy ML techniques. So the first one we'll talk about so previously we did some training and testing splitting. What we're going to do now is improve the model with resampling using the R sample package. So what this does is it takes a training data set and it will take a test fold, but it does this how many times you specify. So it's called K fold, but how many Ks you then choose will be how many iterations it does. So each time it'll take a different training and test set as this diagram visualizes and that's the equation for it. So, and I've just noticed that, let me just correct that. Okay, so as it shows, the false take a sample of the training set and each randomly selected fold acts as the test sample, as we've seen there. So here we're going to use, and um, this is the uh, our sample package as well. We're going to use the V fold CV, and I don't know why they called it V because it's actually K fold, so that's a weird thing in tidy models. So I call it K fold cross validation. And we'll use 10 folds. So you can see there they have 10 iterations. We're going to just implement what we've seen here. We're going to use the previous workflow that we created so we don't have to then um, create the workflow again just for ease of time, really. And then the important part here, as you can see, it's taking a bit longer to spin, is the fit resamples function. Because essentially, what this is going to do is resample it 10 times. 
And if we looked at that fit, fit resample, you'd see the splits that it's made. So for each 10 times, it will talk to you about which fold the splits are. And essentially the way that we're going to do this is if you've got 10 different accuracy and uh, ROC metrics, it's more representative of how that model actually will perform in the wild. That's what I call it. OK, so we've got these resampled and then we're going to use the tune package, a really cool package. We're going to collect these metrics. I'm going to print out these collected metrics as well. So you can see uh, we've got a uh, about 76.32% uh, 76 accuracy in terms of a mean score. So it's taken all those 10 resamples. And here, this is probably a better way to do it, to visualize it. It's taken these 10 samples and the mean estimate of those 10 samples is this, with this standard error. And the ROC is a way, probably a better estimate than the accuracy. Because as we talked about before, this is an imbalanced data set. So your ROC is better at looking at the imbalance because it essentially looks at the difference between the sensitivity and the specificity. Um, so I would use that in imbalanced data sets. If your data is perfectly balanced, then accuracy is a good, a good call to optimize. So another way that you can improve your model. OK. Another way to improve the model is to fit a more complicated model to the data set. And you'll see this a lot in if you ever if you ever want to partake in a Kaggle contest one day, which is a machine learning challenge that they run all the time and every month. I'm a Kaggle, a Kaggle kind of convert and doing it for about three years, but it really improves your uh, machine learning skill set. But yeah, I mean, I probably get a hold of the basics before you do that. OK, so what we're going to do is we're going to fit a, an ensemble method, which is essentially a random forest. And it's a popular method. You've probably heard about it before. Uh, essentially, it grows 300 essentially decision trees. And then what happens at the end is each of those decision trees vote on what they think the outcome prediction is. So whether that patient's stranded or not. Um, but then they will do something called what's called pooled voting or global voting to establish what they think that prediction is based off all 300 uh, trees predictions. And the complexity, the, the algorithm is relatively more complex than that. And if you want to read about it, look at Introduction to Statistical Learning, which is on its second edition. Really good book to get your teeth into a good balance between R code and um, mathematics as well. Not too math heavy, but it gives you the math foundations as well. So I'm going to fit a random forest and we've got 300 trees that we're going to grow. So we're going to make this random forest really complicated to understand the splits in all the features. So we've got. We've got quite a few features. We had eight features in that we want to choose the splits between. And out of those eight feature features, it's going to grow 300 trees and it's going to split them down. And then each one of those trees is going to vote. Again, it gets complicated, so I'll just trust me for now. This is a more complicated model. And again, read the introduction to statistical learning if you're really interested in the, the complexities of it. But it's easy to, to get up and running without knowing that. OK. So we're going to fit the model to our previous training data. So we have this training data partition, didn't we? So here we're not doing resampling on this one. We're just using the, the previous training data. So we're going to fit this random forest model to this previous training data. OK, so we've got this random forest model and it shows you all the parameters that you can utilize. So the random seed number of trees that are going to be exposed that we're going to grow. Again, now I could do the resampling on this model to further improve it and add model representation. So I'm going to use the random forest workflow that I've just created up here. I'm going to, sorry, I'm going to use the random forest model, the fit model that I've just created up here. I'm going to create a workflow. So I'm going to use the workflow. I'm going to add the model, the random forest model. I'm going to add a formula to it. So the dependent variable is the stranded class or the thing I'm trying to predict and all the other variables. I'm going to set a random seed. So I've not explained this until now, but this is essentially so when you run this notebook, your results are reproducible to mine. 
going to um, fit um, the random forest. So we're going to use the random forest workflow we've just created up here. I'm going to use, we're going to fit those 10 resamples that we generated earlier. So that cross validation process that I explained to you. Okay, so we've got these 10 resamples and it says it's doing 10 fold cross validation. Again, like previous, we're going to collect these resamples. So our ROC has improved slightly, um, not massively though. Um, I wouldn't expect it to improve massively, but essentially then that's a collection of a, a deeper, more complicated model and resampling. So that's what, how you could also improve your model. The next step is do resampling and fit in a more complicated model and do something called hyperparameter tuning. So let's talk about hyperparameter tuning. So the Tidy models makes this a lot easier than other languages to tune your hyperparameters. So, I well, I say that there is deep learning packages that do it as well, like uh, Keras has got a Keras tuner. But for for R, for base, more general machine learning modeling from a quantitative perspective, Tidy models makes it really simple with a DIOS package, and I'll show you why. So here we're not going to build a we're not going to build a random forest or anything super complicated. We're not going to build logistic regression. We're just going to build a single decision tree. So this is more of a traditional um, statistical technique. We're going to build a single decision tree. And in the decision tree, there's hyperparameters that we can tune. So how far we go, how, how far the, the tree goes in terms of depth, so how many splits it, um, it makes, and how many, there's something called pruning as well. So how many irrelevant kind of sub, sub trees that it then grows as well. And again, to visualize this, I, there's a really good um, in section on decision trees in introduction to statistical learning. And also there's a lot of good resources around something called CART, so classification and regression trees. Obviously we're doing classification, so you need to focus on that part, but there's lots of reading there. So we're going to tune the cost complexity. So what we're going to use the tune package, and this essentially says, create an empty hyperparameter tuning grid. For tree depth, create an, an empty hyperparameter tuning grid for that decision tree. We're going to set the engine to the R part, so recursive partitioning trees um, that we talked about earlier. And you need to set the mode equal to classification here because it does regression and classification. So now you can see that we've got these main arguments, which is different to what we saw before in the logistic regression model. We have cost complexity equal to tune, this empty uh, list, and the tree depth, this empty list as well. The next step is to, did I actually run that, that block? Yes, I did. The next step is to create the hyperparameter grid search. So, in the dials package, you don't need to worry about all these cost complexity formulas. It knows what type of algorithm you're trying to, to tune. So if it's a, a linear model, then you'll have a certain set of values that you can tune. In uh, a tree-based model, which is what this one, it's going to come up with recommendations for the cost, cost complexity and the tree depth. And you can take it to 10 levels, So, but you can go even further if you want to make it even more complicated. So it'll be out, it'll essentially try every combination of these as hyperparameters and loop around and keep training the model with these parameters. For model speed and training time, let's keep it to 10. So you can see that this has created this grid for me. Yeah, we've only got a tree depth of two and this these co various cost complexity parameters in scientific notation. OK, let's let's say I wanted to in, in, in increase that. I'm going to get more better. I'm going to get more options in terms of the models that are created if I do that. But for time, you could play around with this option later on when you look at the workbooks. For time, I'm going to keep it at 10. Obviously, some of the models now we're going to start to need parallel processing. So we are use the parallel detect cores. So it will look on your machine and look how many CPUs you've got available. And it's going to print all that and we're going to then create a cluster in memory and assign all those cores to that cluster and we're going to register it this cluster in memory so essentially all you need to know is it's a way to optimize your training time of your model 
and it'll always look for the it'll always reserve one core CPU. If you delete this part here, you'll find that your workstation probably locks up. So it's important to keep that in. And with a GPU, you will have more than that that you can, you can work with. So we're going to create the model workflow now, as we've done previously. We can use our tree workflow. We're going to use the workflow parameter. We're going to pipe through. We're going to add the model that we've created with the hyperparameters. We called it tune tree. OK, we're going to add the formula of the stranded class and everything else that we want to predict. We can then use the workflow that we just created here. I'm going to use it with a tune grid. So we're going to use the resamples as the tenfold, so the 10k fold cross validation resampling that we specified. And our grid is going to be that grid of values that we specified here. So essentially it's going to go and train the model on every different combination and permutation of these values. OK. So if we create that, you can see that my model's starting to uh, whir a little bit. And my CPU will go around. So why we why that's happening? We'll go to this part of the process. Why it trains? So we've created the model workflow, and each of these is indicated in each sub step. So I'll show you what you need to do in the markdown. To visualize the tuning process. I've created a little little routine here, a little ggplot that essentially looks at the accuracy and ROC uh, trade off between the cost, cost complexity, so the hyperparameters we're looking at, and the tree depth, which are the two main ones on the decision tree. I'm going to save this out, so I'm going to use gg save to the hyperparameters. If you don't fancy reading what this means, I kind of know what it means. Um, you want to look at the best accuracy, but the trade off between the cost complexity as well. Tune provides you a very handy little function. So you can use the, the tree predicted tuned uh, function that we created. So whatever your model's called. And we're going to use the tune to show the best rock AUC. So it will show you all the best rock um, AUC, so area under the curves to evaluate. And then it's a simple process of then in the next step, getting the best tree. So we're going to use, I think my model's done retraining. No, it's still going. So why we do that? It's going to select the best tree, so the rock ROC. And you can see from this um, set of parameters here, it'll be, pick the best cost complexity and the best tree depth for you. So now we're going to use this, this best tree, or these best hyperparameters, to make predictions on our uh, testing set. So the final workflow we're going to utilize is that tree workflow that we created. And we're going to use the finalize underscore workflow method of the best tree. So this essentially just says select that best tree. And then what is the final workflow that we're then going to fit onto our train fit our training data with? So you do the hyperparameter tuning as a, as a step before you then fit the last final candidate model on your data. So then I'm going to make a prediction against the finalized tree. And I think now it's still going. I think it's probably the network. It, it did it quicker than this earlier. Oops. We're going to predict the best tree. So while that, while that whirs away, well, hopefully it finishes soon. I'm just going to explain what this means. So the final tree is predicted. We've got the final workflow. I'm going to use the parsnip fit function on our training data. And then you can print the final tree prediction. So you can see what's happened. We've got our formula, the model that's been passed through is the decision tree. We are predicting on our stranded class. And the model has got this many observations in the training set. And then if you want to look at the nodes and how it's split it out, you can see that it's actually split on not stranded first, then previous periods of care in the last 12 months is less than 1.5. And then for not stranded, it's it's higher than that. And then you can essentially just build these into if else statements into an algorithm if you really wanted to. But if you chain the pipeline, it does it for you. We had a use case where we essentially trained the decision tree and built this all these splits into a BI tool or a, uh, a data warehouse and just kept retraining the model every month to make sure that the splits were still valid. 
again, I, I'd probably advocate putting in this as part of your pipeline, but decision trees aren't at the cutting edge of machine learning anymore. You're going to be working more with your random forests. You're going to be training your logistic regressions. And the last example here is working with a what I, what I call a kaggle beating algorithm called XG Boost for improving your predictions for, further. So the next step in the process is to use the VIP package to visualize our global variable importance. So we're going to plot our final tree predictions. So can remember we selected the best hyperparameters. We're going to plot those final tree predictions. We're going to extract the fit in parsnip and we're going to use the VIP package and pass the aesthetics, whatever color you want to, to, to style that as and theme minimal. And as you can see, the, the most important variable that we've got is whether the patient's been an inpatient in the last 12 months. Admit date is still there and the age of the patient as well. We're going to save our variable importance plot. And one thing to note is there are other methods for variable importance. We've talked about global variable importance, but there are local variable importance. So if you want to look at the estimate patient by patient, you'd use a package called Lime or you'd use Shapley values. I've got an example of Shapley values and how you interpret them on Python on my website and I'll link all this later on. But essentially how you do it in Python is there's a very similar package in R, but it shows you that you can actually for a patient 488, you can see what the impact of each one of the variables is on that patient. So that's another thing that I didn't get time to build into the tool because it's already jam packed. OK, that's now built anyway, so we can we can do the remaining steps here. So that was the visualization of the plot. This is plucking out the best predictions from our hyperparameter tuning. We need to select the final tree and we're going to finalize that workflow and we're going to print that workflow. We're going to make a prediction on the final tree. You can see I've got these, all these values and all splits. We're going to create that VIP plot, and as you can see in the data, that's dropped a plot in there. Sorry, with the figures, sorry, the figures folder. That's dropped a plot in there of our variable importance. If we wanted to open that up in here bigger, to got a variable importance plot there. And then you get your final fit, and we're, we're going to essentially take you through what that final fit does. So I'm going to use that final workflow. I'm going to use the last fit on my split. So essentially whatever was fitted last in the model, use that on the split. And we use that final fitted metrics to collect those metrics. So how accurate the data is. I'm going to print those final fitted metrics. I'm going to run those as separate lines first. You can see actually that even with high parameter tuning on that decision tree, it's not beating the random forest in terms of ROC or accuracy. So random forest, just the, the choice of uh, more advanced algorithms, probably a better call here. But you could then do hyper parameter tuning on the random forest. And then finally, we're going to create our final fit prediction similar to the that we did before. We're going to collect those predictions. You can see the, the predictions that it's come up with predicted not stranded on our trained test split, row number one, whether it's not stranded or stranded. So the predicted class versus a stranded class. And previous to this, we did a we, we bound it onto the data. The final thing to do would be to visualize this fit on the ROC curve, and I'm going to train that out. I'm going to pump that out into our figures figures file as well. And that takes you through essentially the steps that we can take. You can build a more complex model. You can get more uh, better at resampling. You can go back to the drawing board and work with the domain experts to understand the context better. You can use a combination of model building, hyperparameter tuning, resampling, um, mean imputation, um, feature engineering, which is not covered here, but there are examples of that um, on other blog posts, etc. And if you want to investigate any of the models that are in Parsnip, what arguments they pass. You can use the orgs function, which are the expand, ex, it, it brings back the formals, so the parameters that are, need to be passed to that method. So the formals are what are the parameters in here? So you can see that with our 
decision tree, we use cost complexity and tree depth. But for random forest, we could use the number of trees that it grows, sorry, the, how deep it goes down into the tree at random, the number of trees and the minimum number of trees as potential hyperparameters that we utilize. So one final tutorial, if I can get this in in time, is using extreme gradient boosting. So extreme gradient boosting, you can't see this very well on this um, model here. So I'm just going to go to this parameter. So extreme gradient boosting is a really uh, advanced technique. So essentially it will take an instance of a training set and it will look then at which data has been misclassified. And then it, what it will do again is at random, it will say from those misclassifications, start improving on the error. So from the wrong predictions, make another prediction on the model. Those wrong predictions, make another prediction on the model. From those wrong predictions, make another prediction on the model until essentially it's, it, it's greedily um, predicted everything right. Trouble is with XG boost, it's prone to overfitting, so you do need to do hyperparameter tuning on it as well, because it'll essentially just uh, exterminate, eliminate all the. So essentially, if you're trying to predict stranded class uh, and there's an imbalance where they're all not stranded, it'll essentially veer towards the not stranded classes, and you'll see that happening in this in this example. So prepare the recipe and bake. So this is another couple of functions you might want to do for in case you don't want to create a whole workflow. So there's another way to do it. So you can create a prep step. So I'm going to prepare the recipe first of all, and then simply I want to bake the recipe. So I've got this stranded uh, recipe prepared. And then new data is going to be our training split or you could just refer to the train data, but we're going to use the split function again in our sample. And then we're going to use the KFOB cross validation to, to do that. So that's built my recipe really simply. We don't have to go through the workflow steps there because um, I'm, not, I'm not doing much to this data I'm using. They're already prepared straight, uh, stranded recipe that we created earlier up here. So the steps that we went through and it shows you each step if you want to expose that. So we built that recipe and now what we're going to do is use use this tuning grid. So we're going to create these empty tuning grids as well. We're going to create a thousand trees. We're going to set it to classification. We're going to boost that tree. We're going to use our tuning parameters as the minimum number of trees to grow, how deep the trees grow, the learning rate. So this is important how much it learns around the errors from the previous um, iteration. So it uses something called gradient descent and um, it'll be essentially error back propagation. So similar to neural networks, if you've ever looked into that field. Again, I'd gradient descent. There's a lot of good stuff online that will, that will talk to you about that. Um, I would recommend visiting a guy called Josh Starmer who does really interesting videos on this. So XG boost, we're going to set that model up. And then finally, we're going to specify our hub parameters using the dials package again. So we're going to use the minimum number of trees that we want to tune, the tree depth, the learn rate, the loss reduction, the grid. And then after we've got all these set up, the next step would be to use dials to create a grid uh, for maximum entropy. Uh, we're going to use the XG boost parameters that we just specified here. And the size of the grid then tweaks how far down, how many param parameters in that grid you want to generate. So this is an approach called, there's, there's something called random tuning, random hyperparameter tuning and grid tuning. This is a grid tuning approach. So essentially you can go through all these different combinations, these hyperparameters, there's lots that you can see. You can, you can make it even deeper than that if you put a thousand. It will go through all permutations of each one of those. It's even struggling to create that grid. This will take an, an age to do. Let's say 100. I'll just reset that. Let's stop it. Right, it's going to create that grid. So we've got this grid, and then it's going to send to the random the XG boost model. <laughs> essentially, iterate the grid in, with all these different values. So we're going to create this finally this XG boost workflow. We're going to set up the workflow. We're going to add a model that we previously created, XGBoost model, which is there. And then we're going to add a formula to the stranded class. I'm going to predict everything else. 
So that's set up my workflow. And then the final step is training this beast. So we've got the tune and tune grid, and this is where I'll probably have to leave you because we're running out of time. Uh, the object is the SG boost workflow. I resamples of the stranded folds. Next the boost grid's there, and we're going to pull out the accuracy and the area under the curve from the rock. I'm going to use the tune control grid. I'm going to use spec. When you say set verbose equals to true, it means print it out. So as you can see, that's going away and, and, and training. So for the sake of uh, time, I'm going to show you what it looks like. So we've got the best. We've done the workflow for the model. We've got the best high parameters now to select them. So it's the same function again, show underscore best. And we can select the metric that we want to show the best high parameters on. Then select best. And then we're going to finalize that model so it collapses it down. And then we're going to evaluate our model on the training and test set. So we're going to do that same procedure again. We're going to bake our stranded recipe. We're going to set the new data equals to the training split. We're going to set our train predictions equal to our XG boost model final. So those final hyperparameters that it comes up with. We're going to then fit the model again with the best hyperparameters on our stranded class and everything else. Obviously, you change this part for whatever you're trying to, to produce. You'd use the training procedure and then you predict it out. I'm going to do that twice for the for the training procedure and the testing procedure as well here. And then finally, after that, I'm going to see bind our test predictions like we did previously with our testing split so I can get the um, the original test data and the scores. Finally, I'm going to use the yardstick metrics to pull out the best accuracy. I've got 0.8 is the best accuracy, but probably we want to use AUC for for comparison. But yeah, 80 percent is, is put that up to. And then if I view the confusion table or outputs. I can see that it's doing really well, but probably my balanced accuracy has gone down. It's pretty similar. But it's done really well at classifying those stranded classes and it's then a little bit more imbalanced. Like I said, it, it's prone to overfitting. Finally, I'm going to write those predictions out. So coming to a conclusion, I don't think we're going to have time today to talk to answer questions, but please drop anything on Slack that you want me to answer. Um, we've got a series of workshops uh, planned uh, every month and we're planning for workshops in 2022 as well. For a quick uh, recce around what's already there, we've got a function reference in recipes, so go to the recipes site. I've linked all this in the markdown. There's an associated GitHub to this, so I'll share this link in Slack. So it just takes you through how you build this model in depth. If you want to take the model even further, I also show you how to then not only to train the model, but I show you then how to take your model and deploy it into production as an API that you can access, then how to dockerize that model, and then how you can consume your model once it's been dockerized. I've also included the training XG boost model there. And if you want to know about carrots in more so, so you want to use tidy models and carrot, I did a webinar last year on advanced modeling with supervised machine learning that will be useful to check out. Um, so yeah, if you've got any questions, fire them at, uh, if you've got any issues that you're facing when running the, the notebox, put it in issues. And if you want to reach out to me on Twitter, I'm at StatsGary. Uh, you both find pretty quickly, so follow me there. Um, that's my profile. So yeah, at StatsGary, just hit me up there or talk to me on Slack as well. If you want to drop it in the machine learning section, then that would be great. But yeah, thanks for uh, joining the webinar today. And uh, I will answer your questions after this session. Thank you.